When I was in high school, back in the late 70s, um, I had a gym teacher when I was a senior in high school, and he and I used to have some back and forth theological discussions slash arguments about things. I remember one time, because he knew I was thinking about being a priest, one time he said to me, you know, you guys, you, you don't get married, you're celibate. So, you know, uh, you need to be married because, you know, you can't be a marriage counselor if you're not married. How are you going to counsel these people on marriage as a priest if you're not married? You're not going to know what you're talking about. And I said, well, if I become a priest, it's not to be a marriage counselor. I said, that's a minor role. <clears throat> And, uh, you know, I've become a priest to offer the sacrifice of the Mass, to give people the body of Christ, the forgiveness of sins, to continue the ministry on earth that Jesus began with him forgiving sins and consecrating the Eucharist at the Last Supper, giving the body of Christ to the disciples, ordaining them. I said, that's what I'm doing. I said, uh, besides, you know, <clears throat> as a priest, uh, I'll do some minor counseling maybe, but if they got big problems, I'll send them on to, uh, you know, a professional marriage counselor. So I kind of got him on that one. And so we went, like I said, we went back and forth a lot. So, so I do what I call marriage band-aid counseling. So if you need a surgeon, I'm going to refer you to someone who does that professionally for a living. But if you got a minor problem or two, I've had a few couples come in and they've had some minor issues and I've managed to give them some ideas and things to help them in their relationship and and they never needed to go on uh, further. They, they said, what you told us worked and we're doing fine. So, so every now and then you get something right. But uh, <clears throat> the gospel today touches on uh, a sort of interesting aspect. So the idea of marriage and then eternity where there's no more marriage. So sometimes when you talk about celibacy, people think, you know, that you're attacking marriage and, and you know, uh, oh, you guys think you're better, you're not married. And so. so I think we need to kind of put things in perspective about the situation. So let's look at our Lord's words. The children of this age marry and remarry. What is this age? For conversational purposes during this homily, I'm going to refer to plan A and plan B. What's plan A? Well, it's connected to Adam, also brought to you by the letter A, Adam and Eve. So what does that mean? Well, we need to understand things be, uh, because a lot of people forget some of the basics. Like if I was to ask you, what does original sin do to you? And what's the difference between that and actual sin? I'm sure you all would be able to answer that easily, right? Well, Father, actual sin are the ones we do. That's when we're, uh, you know, uh, striking our breasts during the uh, act of contrition, and the, the, uh, excuse me, the confiteor in the beginning, through my fault, my fault, my fault. Those actual sins are the ones with your name on it. <clears throat> but original sin has Adam and Eve's name on it. But it affects us a whole lot. How's that? Well, let's take a look at how original sin has rocked your world. First of all, we lost paradise. Hence, the present situation. I don't think there's anybody here that thinks this world is paradise. If they do, they need a counselor. So, so we're out of paradise. That's pretty obvious. What else did original sin bring to us? Okay, it brought sin, it brought suffering and pain. Has anyone experienced suffering and pain in your life? I have a feeling not only have we, but we got more coming. You can thank original sin for that one. And death. So, what else can we thank for Adam and Eve listening to the serpent in the beginning and taking the word of the devil over the word of God? Well, we have a weakness in our will so that we have an inclination towards sin. That's why Jesus said in the agony of the garden, pray that you may not enter into temptation for the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So we have a weakness in our heart and our will. We have an inclination towards sin that we struggle against our whole lives. What else do we have? Adam and Eve saw God face to face. Do we see God face to face? Not in this world. We see him darkly through faith. And as we pray and avoid sin, the light of God's grace comes into our hearts and minds and souls and we begin to see more clearly the truth of God's existence and of our relationship with him and the truth that he reveals to us in scripture and in sacred tradition. 
So those are some of the effects. And so what is plan B? Well, plan B started to get laid out right about the same time plan A failed. Genesis 3.15, one of the most commented on lines in scripture. So uh, God, of course, you know, curses the serpent, you know, because Adam blames Eve, you know, the woman you gave me, she, she gave me the fruit. And Eve says the serpent tricked him, he lied to me. So she blames the serpent. Flip Wilson's line, the devil made me do it. And there's the serpent. Who does he blame? Nobody. Because he's the father of lies and a murderer from the beginning, as Jesus tells us in John chapter 8. So he gets to crawl around on his belly. Now, I've killed a few snakes around here. I hate snakes. Some people tell me, don't kill the black snakes. They're good snakes. Not when they're at my front door. So uh, not to mention little kids going around the hall. Most of the snakes I've killed have been running around by the rectory or somewhere uh, uh, nearby the hall. Now, I've killed two copperheads, but one time there was about a five-foot black snake running right, right across the threshold of the door of the rectory. Now, this one spoke English. Because <laughs> I said to him, you stay right there. I'll be back in a minute with a shovel to take your head off. And when I got back, he was gone. So he knew what I said. So God curses the serpent, you'll crawl on your belly, and then he says some interesting statements. I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman. What does that mean? So the serpent and the woman are now enemies. That's Mary and the devil. And so we have a prophecy of the power of the Blessed Mother, that she's going to become the great enemy of the devil, and that's why hell works so hard to get us to downgrade the role of Mary in salvation, because she is such a wonderful helpmate to the mystical body of Christ. Remember, Eve was to be the helpmate to Adam in the Garden of Eden. Well, Mary is the helpmate to Christ in the mystical body of the church. She helps through her role, of course, as her, uh, being the mother of Jesus and connecting him to us through the incarnation so that God enters into the human family through Mary. She is the, the, the method that God used to become a human being. But besides that, her prayers in heaven for us. So we're going to put enmity between you and the woman and between her seed and your seed. What does that mean? What's the seed of Satan? Those that follow his teaching and do evil upon the earth. So what about the seed of the woman? That's a prophecy for Jesus. So Jesus is going to be there on the cross. He is the seed of the woman, of Mary and of Eve. And then the Pharisees are the seed of the serpent. The offspring, the wheat that's sown among the weeds. And so what do we see the description comes next? He will strike at your heel while you strike at his head. So the heel of Jesus, of course, the nail goes through his feet on the cross, but Satan loses his power over the human race through sin to make us go to hell with him because Jesus now pays the debt for our sins and we are freed and the gates of paradise are reopened. And he says to the good thief, St. Dismas on the cross, today you'll be with me in paradise. So the striking at the head, hence my line to my English-speaking serpent that was at the door. I'm coming back to cut your head off. I wasn't going to cut his tail off. The way to get him is if you're going to kill a snake, you strike at the head. And so that's what the reference is very clearly in Genesis 3.15. So what we see in the world is remnants of plan A, remnants of paradise. So the original plan was for man and woman to be in paradise, to get married, to have children, to be together with physical uh, union and intimacy. And, and the two purposes of marriage, you know, of course, is, is life and love. So life would be the children, love would be the, the joy of the physical and emotional union of, of the loving couple together. That's plan A. Plan A is in this world of this age, hence what Jesus says, the children of this age, plan A, plan Adam and Eve, which is gone because of sin, marry and remarry. But those deemed worthy for plan B, connected to Jesus' passion, death, and resurrection, connected to eternity, so this age is pl the place and time, but plan A, and plan B is connected to eternity with Christ, 
deemed worthy to attain to the coming age and to the resurrection of the dead, neither married nor given in marriage, for they are like the angels. Aha! So angels are a spiritual being. They do not have a physical connection, you know, because they're, they're spirits. They're not, they don't have bodies. They can appear to have bodies when they come to visit us occasionally, as we see in Scripture. So the reality is that we live our lives really either following plan A, trying to cling to the remnants of paradise that are left, and you know, you can see beautiful mountains and flowers and things like that, and, and we, you know, have to a certain extent a certain beauty and strength and youth when we're in our uh, late teens and early 20s, but then, oh, there goes that evil original sin again, because what happens after we finish, I think, age 23, 24, the brain stem stops, we stop growing and we start aging. And so as, we, as the effects of death, original sin. Again, you know, you need to realize original sin has changed our lives. We don't think about it much, but it has changed everything. So sin, loss of paradise, pain and suffering, death, judgment, uh, hell, um, weakness of will, so we've got to struggle and carry our cross to do good, darkness of intellect, so we need to read the scriptures to have the truth revealed, to enlighten our hearts and minds. All of those brought to you by original sin. Amazing how many dominoes fell from the first sin. So that's why we don't want to bring more sin into our lives. Because all it does is, it's a pile on it, it's a compound. When we do actual sin, which is the part that has our name on it, we're just adding more sin on top of original sin and it's just getting worse. Now fortunately, our God is an awesome God who's in the business of forgiveness. And so from the cross he said, Father forgive them, they know not what they do. So Jesus uh, forgives us, but we need to truly be sorry and we need to be with plan B, denying ourselves daily, taking up the cross and following Christ. So as we look at this, this reference here, um, so plan B is an understanding that this world is a preparation for the next, that it's temporary. And you know, the problem with going with plan A, if you want to try to go for sin and things in this world over heaven, so Jesus says what? I've got it up on the wall over. What does it profit a man if he gain the whole world yet lose his own soul? First of all, nobody even gets the whole world. You get a little smidgen. So in exchange for your soul, you get a smidgen of the world. Do you get to keep it? No. Maybe not even for another year. You never know when you're going to die. That's the end of plan A. That's the end of your smidgen of the world that you may have lost your soul for. It's a lousy, rotten deal. Doesn't get any worse than that. However, Jesus, which scripture calls the new Adam, if you look at the base of the mural, you see the skull of Adam there reminding us Jesus is dying on the cross because the first Adam ate the forbidden fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So now Jesus is at the tree, Christ is the new Adam, Mary's the new Eve, and they are what, at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? No, they are at the tree of the cross. Jesus is being crucified on the cross and paying the debt for that sin of Adam and Eve and all of our sins, the ones that have our name on, actual sins, the ones that we say at the beginning of Mass through my fault, my fault, my grievous fault, where we are acknowledging. Because, you know, you, it's kind of hard to get forgiveness from God if you don't acknowledge that you're a sinner. So that's one of the reasons we do it at the beginning of Mass. So uh, the thing is, is Jesus says we're going to be uh, like the angels. Now, first of all, another thing, um, uh, this movie that, that they, they play at Christmas time, I, it, drives, it drives me crazy. I love the movie, It's a Wonderful Life, but this thing about, you know, uh, Clarence getting his wings. Angels come with wings, okay? They get that when they're created by God. They don't earn their wings by going around and doing a good deed. Bit of a theological error built in there. Now, um, as we look at this, what, what else do we see uh, coming forth from this? The knowledge of vocations, okay? A vocation is a calling. So everyone has a calling in life. Some people are called to get married and have children. Some people are called to be single, which is different from a consecrated religious life, which would be like brothers. You know, I was taught by the Brothers of the Sacred Heart back in Jersey at one point when I went to St. Joe's, and then I went back to St. Mary's to the Sisters of No Mercy. 
And then um, the, uh, so the sisters and the brothers are consecrated to the celibacy life. And then the uh, priesthood is also connected to that. And so now latest in the news, they're always talking about when, you know, when is the church going to end celibacy? Well, I would say to the newscast, you need to read the New Testament because St. Paul encourages celibacy for everybody. He says, I wish that all of you were like me, but each has his own gift in this way and that. So St. Paul talks about how a married person can be divided because they have to please their spouse and take care of their children, whereas a person who's not married has a little more single-mindedness to be devoted to the service of the Lord. So he's encouraging celibacy, not just for priests, but for everybody. And then he, uh, of course, as I said, says each one has his gift in that. And so depends on what our calling is. Some may be called to uh, marriage and some called to the single life. So it's a question of what we're called to. But the reality is, is that marriage, this age, is connected to plan A. And having children is part of plan A, which comes to an end when we leave this world and go into plan B in eternity. Now, St. Thomas Aquinas has a nice statement in, in his writings where he says there will exist a special relationship between a man and a woman who are married in this world in eternity, a, a special friendship. And so that's a, a, a nice thing that he points out. But the reality is, is that uh, the marriage that we have here and now in this world will, will not be the same when we get into the next world. In fact, very little is going to be the same. But we need to understand, St. Paul says that marriage between a man and a woman is a symbolic foreshadowing of the marriage between the lamb and his bride, the church. In Isaiah, it says, your builder shall marry you. So in this world, the body of the man and the woman are designed, you know, we talk about your soulmate, the body of the man and the woman are designed to go together and, and uh, in marriage. And so what about the soul? Well, uh, the s true soulmate of our soul is the Holy Spirit, because that's where we come from anyway. God breathes into Adam the breath of life, and our soul is built from and connected to the Spirit of God. That's where you get your soul, your self-awareness, your existence. And so the true soulmate for our human spirit is the Holy Spirit of God. So when we are baptized, we pour the water and the Holy Spirit, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Your sins are forgiven. The guilt from original sin is gone. Uh, and any actual sins you commit, you become temples of the Holy Spirit. You become one with the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And you can say, Our Father who art in heaven, because now he is your Father, because Christ dwells within you. And so you enter into the family of God. Unfortunately, however, baptism does not remove the effects of original sin which is the weakness of the will and the darkness of the intellect, or the effects really of actual sin, which can and does weaken our will further and darken our intellect more. So the, the more we sin, the more we're going to have problems believing in God, the more we're going to have difficulty doing God's will. That's why we pray, because prayer reverses the effects of sin. It strengthens our will. It enlightens our intellect, makes it easier for us to believe. So prayer makes our faith grow and it makes our will get stronger to resist sin. So we become more aware and recognize quicker the truths of the faith and it's easier for us to fight against sin. So that's the beauty of prayer, the opposite of sin. And that's why it's so important for us to be praying every day. Prayer connects us to Christ and plan B in eternity. So I liken the people, you know, who are so into this world and the things of the body realize that, you know, we're going to, we could go at any time. Anyone could suddenly get a brain aneurysm and be gone today. You know, we don't want that to happen, but I'm just saying they're, they're like people rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic as it's going down. So plan A is gone. It's forever. It's going down. It's going down a tube. Plan B, that's the new plan. That's the one coming in eternity. Christ, the God of eternity, has come into time, into this world to show us the way. He is the way, the truth, and the life. So um, what does it say in Scripture, in St. Peter's writings? 
It says, God has already destroyed the world by water. He will again destroy the world uh, and the heavens by fire. There will be a new heavens and a new earth. Talk about the Big Bang. We got two more coming. There's the, there's the fire that's going to destroy not only the earth, but the heavens, everything. St. Peter, you can read it yourself. And then, then God's creating a new heaven and a new earth, a new Big Bang, as it were, if we want to talk about the scientific angle. So that is the future. Celibacy is of the future. The people who live celibacy, whether it's a priest or someone who's like a brother or sister, that is a foreshadowing of the resurrection, a hint, a reminder of plan B, coming to a soul near you, specifically your soul as you enter into eternity. So that's why Jesus says the children of this age marry and, are, and remarry. So it's this age, plan A, Adam and Eve. Then, but those who are deemed worthy to attain the coming age, plan B, Jesus and Mary, um, the new heavens and the new earth, and to the resurrection of the dead, neither marry given in marriage, they are like the angels. And the angels are our fellow servants of God. So as we go through life, let us remember the plan. Let us remember the angels who we hope to be with and be like, and not look to the animals who only follow their lower nature. Many times you hear people say this, you know, this guy's an animal, this criminal, or what he did, he's an animal. That's because they've given into their lower nature, the, which comes from original sin. Again, original sin, you have no idea how much it impacts your life until you start to connect the dots. Original sin and actual sin, big things in life that affect us dramatically all throughout our lives and eternity. Fortunately, however, we also have another big thing to counter it, grace and prayer. Plan B, remember grace and prayer. That gives us the hope that we may become deemed worthy to attain life in the coming age and join in the resurrection of the dead.